Hey friends, Pastor Andrew here. I had a realization that this Sunday is Super Bowl Sunday, and that's when we have our last um, workshop on becoming neighborhood missionaries scheduled. And I've also realized that we might as well have called it Conversations with Bobby or call them training videos because many of you are watching them later but not necessarily participating. So I'm guessing that's not going to be the issue Sunday night because everybody wants to probably watch the game and enjoy some festivities. I, for one, uh, appreciate your prayers as I look at surgery on February 8th. So I'd enjoy some time just unwinding, watching the game as I get ready and get ready rather and get over my nerves with that. So I figure here is our last training video instead of workshop on becoming neighborhood missionaries. And we're talking about risk-taking mission and service. So I'll go ahead and share my screen here and we'll launch into this. I actually start the slideshow from the beginning here. Um, so risk-taking mission and service is our topic. And a lot of these have everything to do with what we might call the Great Commission and the Great Commandment. Um, the Great Commandment, of course, is uh, that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, Jesus said. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two things hang all the law and the prophets. And then there's also the great commission. I'm not sure why I have Matthew 28, 18 through 29 there. That should just be 18 through 20. It says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So we've got the great commission. We've also got the great commandment. And then I'd like to consider what we might call the great commitment is something I, I've coined a phrase for, that we read in John 21, verses 15 through 17. Basically, that's a narrative. That's a longer story than the short Great Commission passage and the short Great Commandment passage. Essentially, um, Jesus is having a conversation with Peter, and each time that he asks, do you love me? He says, feed my lambs, tend to my sheep, feed my sheep. So according to a lot of these verses, what would we say the mission or the purpose of the church is according to these verses? And then other questions to ask here, of course, is what is the mission of the United Methodist Church? And what is the mission of Salem United Methodist Church in particular? Well, we see in the Great Commandment and the Great Commission, a lot of what we ca might call the purposes or general things that we think about in ministry with ter in terms of loving God has everything to do with what we've talked about with passionate worship. Um, loving your neighbor as yourself has everything to do with radical hospitality and some of these other things that we're talking about um, to, uh, let's see, intentional disci discipleship. You see that right there in the great commandment. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations baptizing them, that's welcoming, welcoming, welcoming them into the body of Christ through the sacrament of, of baptism, um, teaching them to obey. So again, that has to do with discipleship, that has to do with growing in faith. And um, certainly as we're talking about it here is risk-taking mission is, is, is continuing to realize that discipleship is not just about me growing and then keeping that to myself, Intentional discipleship moves into risk-taking mission, where I am told to go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. So by definition, as we talked about last week, a disciple is a disciple maker. And that's where we then get the concept that the mission and purpose of the church has everything to do with this, to go and make disciples. That's why the mission of the United Methodist Church is to go and make disciples for the transformation of the world. And our trajectory in the United Methodist Church, according to our bishop's mission plan here in Arkansas, is to go make disciples who make disciples equipped to transform lives, communities, and the world. 
And then last but not least, I hope you know the three G words that come in the mission statement of Salem United Methodist Church, which is to glorify, go, and grow, or rather glorify, grow, and go. Our mission is to make disciples who make disciples, who glorify God in worship, and we've talked about passionate worship, grow in discipleship, we've talked about intentional faith development, and now risk-taking mission has everything to do with our um, discipleship in its connection to go and mission to the world. So in its entirety, again, is uh, to make disciples who make disciples, who glorify God in worship, grow in discipleship, and go in mission to the world. So what do we mean when we're talking about risk-taking mission? Well, it means that we're putting ourselves out there. We're taking a risk. And I want to also think about some of the last words of Jesus um, that we see in the book of Acts, where he says, to go from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So Jerusalem might be our, our comfort zone. Jerusalem might be, hey, it's right there in the name of our church. Go from Salem to Conway, to Arkansas, to the ends of the earth. And specifically, when Jesus is talking about go to Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, he's saying Conway but also those people in Conway that you may not get along with or that you may see differently. You see, Samaria, for the Jews, there is no such thing as a good Samaritan, and vice versa, for the Samaritans, there is no th such thing as a good Jew. They did not see eye to eye. So getting out of our comfort zones into these deeper and deeper concentric circles has everything to do with risk-taking mission, has everything to do with putting ourselves on the line because we are stepping out into uh, uh, places that are not our comfort zone, stepping out to people maybe we disagree with or are different than us or that we don't see eye to eye with, that have some different um, religious, political, social backgrounds than we do. And yet we are called to love all people, to love our neighbors as ourselves. So risk-taking mission, yes, it's very much a risk when we put ourselves out there. I had another friend talk about this concentric circle thing is some of us are just like, yeah, let's go. Let's, let's do this. Others are kind of tip your toe in the water. You know, it's, it's the diving in, jumping in, cannonball in versus those who have to test the water with their toe and see if it's okay. Um, a little bit of discomfort, like putting one foot in, one foot out. Okay, I'm in my comfort zone. Now I'm just going to take a step outside my comfort zone a little bit. So I hope in these workshops and these messages on becoming neighborhood missionaries, you're thinking about or working on that, praying on how you want to see God stretch you a little bit further out of your comfort zone. So some definitions. We actually return to radical hospitality. We come back to where we started. We talked about how meaningful and lasting relationships are formed when we reveal ourselves to others or they reveal themselves to us. Do you remember the stack of objects we talked about on top of the, uh, let's see, what was it? Do I remember them? On top of the desk was a nameplate, and on top of the house, I'm getting ahead of myself. On top of the nameplate is a house, and on top of the house is a group of people, and the group of people are reaching up into a work glove, and the work glove is tossing a strange airplane that has a propeller made of a tennis racket and a light bulb on the other end. So we talked about how we can use these stack of objects that hopefully you have memorized now to remind us, oh, okay, when I meet someone new, well, hello, my name is Andrew. What is your name? The nameplate. Oh, do you live here in town? Or where do you live? Those types of questions. And it just leads us into deeper and deeper places of the conversation. We also talked about using con conversation expanders. So when we meet somebody and we hear an interesting name, we can say, oh, wow, that's such a neat name. Where did you get it? What is, what is its origin? Do you like your name? And so you can spend a lot of time just on that first object, the nameplate, really getting to know someone. And this helps us with ongoing conversation because we have some conversation areas in our mind. That's really good for us introverts. Believe it or not, I'm a, what you might call an extroverted introvert. Um, I get nervous when I meet new people. 
quite honestly. And yet I'm an extroverted introvert that people are some, are, I love people, but I also need time away. I need time with uh, alone or time to be by myself. So that's why I classify myself as an extroverted introvert. I can just be just fine in a group of people, but I can also be fine just by myself. And so um, that helps introverts who might be nervous about getting to know new people to have a strategy for that. Um, but it also helps the extroverts who are often, as we classify them stereotypically, the life of the party, um, helping extroverts to be quiet <laughs> and to listen and to ask good questions in order to develop the relationship and get to know about the new, new person they're meeting versus talking about themselves. And I think we all tend to struggle with wanting to talk about ourselves uh, too much versus trying to listen and to build a relationship by listening and understanding new people. I've heard it said that the difference between introverts and extroverts is um, whose shoes you look at. An introvert looks at their own shoes, an extrovert looks at their shoes, at the other person's shoes. Either, either way, we're still kind of into our own world. We're either introverts into the um, self-reflective mode, uh, extroverts into, hey, <laughs> I'm the life of the party, let me tell you about myself. So we need, both of us, introverts and extroverts, to really work on this communication skill. And so this has a lot to do with risk-taking mission and service and what we're going to talk about tonight, which is a particular skill, or whenever you're watching this, not necessarily tonight. Um, and that is, we are called to be in mission and service. That's why I've said so much during this series, at least I hope I have, um, when you're asking, what is a neighborhood missionary? Well, you are. If you're a follower of Christ, you are a missionary, whether you like it or not, where you live, where you work, where you go to school, and where you play. Um, so here's what I wanted to talk about in this video is um, 1 Peter 3.15 puts it this way, in your heart, honor Christ as the Lord, always being prepared to make a defense or always being ready to give a reason to anyone who asks for you, a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. Always be ready, be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks for a reason for the hope that is in you. So the desire here is that we hope in these relationships that you're building, that you are building in a place of gentleness and respect and kindness and showing love and compassion, that you're building a rapport with new people. And eventually maybe they'll ask you, why are you doing this? What is this about? Why are you so kind? I've never met someone who takes this much interest in someone that they haven't met before. Well, I mean, until we meet people, we've never met them before, have we? But this is then maybe your opportunity to finally share and share about um, the gospel, share about your own faith story, and so that's some of the skills we want to develop tonight. But as we do in each of these training videos or workshops or conversations with Bobby and me, um, we talk about what is the situation now and what, we, what would we like it to be? My guess is the situation now is, I, I don't even like to approach a stranger. Uh, you know, how do I do that? I, I still need to introduce myself, as I've mentioned, to my neighbor across the street. We'll wave and say, hello. There's even a happy birthday sign out front a couple weeks ago. And I said, happy birthday, somebody. Well, I should get to know that somebody's name. <laughs> I should get to know our neighbors a little better than that. So the challenge uh, is true for me. I, I need to practice what I'm preaching. So practice. Here's a few things that we wanna talk about is how to share your story how to share your story, first of all, and then we'll look at how to share the gospel. And this is risky. You're really taking an opportunity to share about yourself. And I would encourage you, as a matter of fact, I've had several assignments through seminary and through this process of uh, working towards ordination, where I've had to write out my call story. I've had to write out my faith story, uh, my testimony, my witness, whatever you wanna call it. And if you think those words testimony and witness are churchy words, they kind of are, but think of testimony and witness more in terms of uh, in a courtroom. If you give a testimony, you're telling ultimately your 
story or your side of the story. And your witness, if you are called as a witness, is that you are a witness to the events. You're a, a witness in some fashion to something having happened. So that's what it talks about when you hear people talk about witnessing for Jesus. You're sharing your witness. You are sharing how Jesus has affected your life. And so a way to do this, again, to grab us practical things to hold on to, are to simply answer these three questions. And again, I, I suggest you, you write this out, and I suggest you practice telling your story. And you might have what we might, we might call it the two-minute speech or a two-hour speech. In other words, you might have an elevator speech, but you also might have a, a flight speech. You know, they're totally different conversations when you have just a few minutes on an elevator with somebody versus uh, an hour or two on a flight with somebody. So the way this looks is talk about your life before you knew Jesus. What was your life like before you knew Jesus? And I'll put it this way for those like me who grew up in the church is what was your life like before you knew Jesus the way you do now? In other words, our relationship is always developing. We don't need to think of, oh, I have some amazing story to tell because I was a sinner saved by grace and all of this stuff. Um, so what was your life like before you knew Jesus? Now describe how you met Jesus. And then finally, after you met Jesus, how have things changed since then? <laughs> before you met Jesus or before you knew Jesus now, how you met Jesus, and then how your life has been like since. And of course, in this area, I wanna say, don't say it was all roses and sunshine. Don't say that, well, now that I've met Jesus, everything is perfectly fine because we know that that's not accurate. Jesus actually said that you will have troubles, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So we will experience trials and troubles as Christians, but now we have somebody who is with us in that struggle of life. So essentially, here it is. Here's, here's my testimony. I, as I mentioned, I grew up in the church, so I've kind of always known God. I've always known Jesus. I grew up loving to, to read the Bible and to study the scriptures. And I could say it this way, though. It wasn't until my early 20s, that I moved from a place of maybe knowing about God, knowing a lot about the Bible, knowing a lot about Jesus, to really moving into a more real, authentic relationship. So for, for me, it went from knowing about God to knowing God. <laughs> and I think there's a difference. We can know a lot of things, but that, that God really moved in my heart, as, as we've heard of John Wesley. He was in ministry for years before his heart was strangely warmed, and he knew that he was saved. So I don't necessarily have that, that born again or rebirth moment, but I have moments over time where I've met Jesus, where I've surrendered more of my life to God bit by bit, where I've had encounters with God in such a way that I think we have these, uh, not a defining moment, but defining moments and so my life since then, I've moved into ministry. I was a youth pastor, and now I'm a pastor. Uh, but life is certainly not without its trials. But, but God is there with me every step of the way. So there you go. That was maybe an elevator speech. I talked about before I knew Jesus, at least as I know him now. I talked about how I met Jesus through those different moments along the way. So that's another caveat. It might be an instant in time for you. Uh, you might have something that you can really recall, but for many of us, it's several moments along the way. And then finally, I shared a little bit about my life since I've known Jesus. So again, write this out, practice it, share it. And then finally, the skill we want to talk about here is how to share the gospel message. How to share the gospel message. And we can do this on a napkin by using this illustration that you, you might have seen before. It's essentially using Romans 6.23 to paint a picture of the gospel. The gospel message in a nutshell is right there in Romans 6, verse 23. So just memorize this. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life 
in Christ Jesus our Lord. Wages, sin, death, gift, God, life. You got six words. If you can get there, those six words help you get there. So we might then, as we're describing this for somebody, we could even, like I said, draw it on a napkin or a piece of paper. We draw that, that chasm between God and ourselves. You put us on one side, God on the other. Sin is the chasm. The cross that you see there actually comes last as you're illustrating this for them. So we talk about how the wages of sin is death. And then I ask people, what is a wage? Well, we are familiar with the concept of minimum wage or a wage is something that you earn for a job that you've, you've done. So the wage, the payment of sin, what we deserve is death. But on the other side, God offers us a gift. So the gift of God is eternal life. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Now, what's a gift? Or what's the difference between a gift and a wage? Well, a gift is something given to you. And it should be unconditional. We're in such a reciprocal society that we think in terms of, well, I was given a gift, now I need to give something back, and we just go back and forth and back and forth. But this gift of God is something that we can't reciprocate. There's nothing we can do to earn it. God has given us this gift. And then we can draw the cross there. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. So you draw that on your piece of paper. Jesus is the bridge. Jesus takes us over that chasm. So we might think, oh, we can try and earn that gift. We try and jump over that chasm. We try and get a running start. We jump on a motorcycle like Evil Knievel and, and build a ramp, and we try and ramp over that thing. But we can't. There's no way we can possible, possibly reach it. The only person, the only God who can do it is God through the person of Jesus Christ who allows us to cross that bridge. So at that point, we can you know, share with someone, where are you in this process? What's stopping you from crossing that bridge or at least um, checking out Jesus? So you see, it's kind of straightforward. It's, of course, um, maybe not as easy as it sounds, but the more we practice at these things, the more we practice at sharing the gospel, the more we practice at sharing God's story, um, the better we get at it. So we return then back to the Great Commission, of course. And I want you to think in terms of what was helpful for you in the, this video or these series of videos. What concept was most important for you? A lot of times I like to ask this question, based on what we've learned, what will you start doing, stop doing, or do differently? And then what are some tools that you can use? And um, finally, what's one new thing that you'll try this week? Will you try to share your story with somebody? Will you just work on writing it out? Um, just a lot of different ways you can approach this. So having come to the end of these um, series of workshops that have become, I guess, conversations, have become training videos, I hope they are helpful to you in some fashion. So that's it. Let me pray for us. God, we love you, and I just thank you so much for uh, Salem United Methodist Church and others who might also wish to watch these videos and think of themselves. I mean, help us to think of ourselves as neighborhood missionaries, where we live and where we work and where we go to school and where we play. Let us realize just how much we are called to share the love of God, share the love of you with our neighbors. So help us to do that. We pray in Jesus' name in the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Well, God bless you all and have a great day.